It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Speaker, we know that uh, last week's budget failed to meet the moment that we're in. But the more you dig into this, the worse it gets. Hidden in the back pages of the latest budget, they've snuck in billions of cuts to services that people rely on. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Will he explain why his government buried $6 billion in cuts at a time when the people of this province are really struggling? To reply, the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you uh, to the member opposite for that question through you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I don't know. Uh, you look at the budget. Uh, let's look at the numbers. Uh, I, I'm a numbers guy. Um, you know, the increase in the uh, budget to $204.7 billion includes, includes a $6 billion increase to health care spending yeah, yeah. right next year. Oh. That's an 8.1 percent increase. That's an increase. I don't, I don't know. Uh, secondly, education, which includes child care funding. It includes funding for catch-up. It includes funding for mental health. It includes funding for literacy and a whole range of things. More funding per pupil, as the Minister of Education has highlighted, is going up $2.3 billion. That's 7.1%, Mr. Speaker. I'm looking at numbers. Response. Now, maybe their world uh, looks at numbers very differently, but I'm looking at the facts. <laughs> the supplementary question. Well, let's talk about the facts, and let's, let's talk about priorities, because budgets are about priorities, and what we're seeing is that this government has the wrong priorities. Perhaps the members over on the government side should take a second look, because they are making cuts. They should check out page 150 of the budget book, which reveals this government is cutting funds to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, cuts to tourism, culture and sport, cuts to francophone affairs, cuts to agriculture. Speaker, will the Premier again explain why these cuts will mean what these cuts are going to mean for homelessness programs, for the Ontario Arts Council, for local transit and for bilingual services? Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, clearly the budget uh, focused on lifting up everybody yep. in Ontario. Everybody. Everybody. All 15.4 million people almost in this province. And Mr. Speaker, that increase in population underscores why we have a sense of urgency on this side of the House to get things done, Mr. Speaker, because we have a housing shortage, a housing crisis in Ontario. We don't have enough hospitals, long-term care facilities. And in fact, you mentioned homelessness. And thank you for raising that. Very important point. What did we do last week? We increased funding for homelessness by $202 Order. million, dollars, a record increase for people who need a hand up, Mr. Speaker. Because, Mr. Speaker, we're not going to let down the people coming to this province nor are we going to let down the people in this province. Yeah. Final supplementary. Speaker, all you have to do is look at their expenses from this year and compare them to what's actually in the budget. Speaker, it's not just a difference in reporting, it is a shell game. This government is hiding cuts that are going to eliminate services at a time when people really need them. And that's not right. Order. They're cutting funds to the Attorney General, to infrastructure, to transportation, to seniors and accessibility, and cuts to the Solicitor General. Speaker, back to the Premier. What's that going to mean for Ontarians who are waiting for health care, who are at the Landlord and Tenant Board, who are looking for legal aid or seniors' home care programs? Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, only NDP math could come to that conclusion. <laughs> you know, the base programs Dr. have increased Strong. from $175 billion to $190 billion. And do you know why, Mr. Speaker? Because we are investing in the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We are investing over $15 billion of new funding, new money over the next three years for health care, Mr. Speaker. Why don't, you, why don't you go talk to the OMA, go talk to the OHA, go talk to the CMHA, look it up. These are organizations that deliver acute care, mental health care, home and community care, long-term care. Mr. Speaker, they all said thank you to the government. We're hitting the priorities that the people of Ontario need and want. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Uh, good morning. My question is to the Premier. This government 
has granted thousands of mining claims on treaty territory and is trying to fast track dangerous projects against the will of the people who live there, eat the fish, and drink the water. Look in the gallery and you will see leadership and over 80 rights holders of five First Nations who are here to stand up for their homelands. Speaker, uh, will this government commit today to obtain the consent of First Nations before making any plans for their homelands? Members, will please take their seats. Reply, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the honourable member for his question and welcome members from uh, the isolated northern communities. You know, Mr. Mr. Speaker, from the outset, our government has been focused on consensus and relationship building, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to resource projects and legacy infrastructure. And in fact, it started a couple of years ago. I know that Alvin Fidler is, is in the uh, galleries here today, and I think back to uh, uh, the member from uh, Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, when he was a Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, and we revamped that uh, piece of legislation to reflect consensus. Uh, I appreciated that then, the ability for us to sit at a table, build partnerships and friendships, relationships that reflect the need to build out our northern infrastructure and resource projects around consensus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Uh, speaker, uh, that type of response means that they do not care about First Nations rights. Speaker, uh, the, government, the government says it respects First Nations, but people here tell me that this government has granted thousands of mining claims in their backyards without prior notice, let alone consent. How does that show respect for the people who have always lived there and cared for their lands. Will this government again today to end the antiquated and offensive free entry staking system? Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Again, Mr. Speaker, what we're focused on in building relationships under the leadership of this Premier uh, we meet very regularly with Indigenous leaders from across this province, in fact, regularly with the Chiefs of Ontario, their Grand Chiefs, etc. And Mr. Speaker, those, those meetings are focused on building consensus, Mr. Speaker. They're, they're, they're about ensuring that resources extracted from Northern Ontario, uh, Mr. Speaker, are distributed fairly and, and most importantly, under the resource revenue sharing agreements, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that Indigenous communities are involved in the benefits of those kinds of resource activities. And it isn't just for the financial benefits of, of the resource projects, Mr. Speaker. In many instances, in fact, all of our resource revenue sharing agreements reflect participation from Indigenous leadership in the responsible management of those resources, Mr. Speaker. So we want to continue down that course. We think this provides a balanced, fair way for Indigenous communities to, to derive benefits from those resource activities, Mr. Speaker, Response. to have their say in how and why they're developed. Right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker, uh, we are not communities. We are actually nations. Yes. Speaker, uh, this government says it wants prosperity for all Ontarians. But let me be clear, these five First Nations who traveled thousands of kilometers to be here are the ones that have to live, up, live with the mess that is left behind after mining. Their children, their grandchildren, will have to drink the water downstream from these mines. Will this government promise today to gain their agreement rather than bulldozing over their lands and waters. Better yet, will today the Premier meet with these leaders today? Minister of Indigenous Affairs. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What our government will continue to put a priority on is the shared and common interests about transforming Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, to a place where not only people benefit from the economic opportunities, the largest sub-sovereign state environmental policy I think that could be advanced anywhere is through mining critical minerals, Mr. Speaker, but the, le the legacy infrastructure that's required to support it. Many, if not most, of the communities that are represented here today, I've had a special opportunity to live in or work in and or work for, Mr. Speaker, and I can tell you, they all want better infrastructure. They all, uh, for the most part, want road access to improve the health, social and economic opportunities for their communities. That's what a provincial government does, Mr. Speaker. We create the platforms for these kinds of Response. resource activities to advance responsibly and safely, at the same time creating new opportunities, real opportunities for isolated communities that their members are asking me for every single day, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. I would ask our guests who are in the gallery to refrain, to refrain from the outburst. Going to to refrain from this outburst, or you'll be asked to leave. We are pleased to have guests visiting us in the legislature, but there can be no outbursts from the galleries, or we wouldn't be able to um, comport ourselves in, in the way that we need to to do our business. Where are we? Okay. Member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, this week, Global News revealed that the government is withholding information about the Ontario Line Transit Project, a public-private partnership which has skyrocketed past the government's original cost estimates from $10.9 billion to $19 billion. Yesterday, the Premier said we aren't hiding anything, but his officials have redacted documents, so financial disclosure on the Ontario Line is impossible for people from Global News. Speaker, simple question. Why won't this government disclose the financial costs of the Ontario Line? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Well, in the early days of our first mandate, the Premier laid out our government's plan to build badly needed transit in the Greater Toronto Area, and that includes the signature new Ontario Line. Since those early days, Mr. Speaker, we've taken our responsibility to taxpayers very seriously, and that's why our government passed, with no help from that member or the members of the opposition, the Building Transit Faster Act, because we know, Mr. Speaker, that time is money. But in addition to being able to deliver value for taxpayers, we also need to have a competitive procurement process, which is why our government decided to break up the, the procurement for the Ontario Line into three separate packages. As we refined estimates for those packages, Mr. Speaker, they were commercially sensitive. But as soon as those contracts were awarded Response. and have been awarded, they have been publicly posted online with their values. The South Civils were valued at $6 billion, Mr. Speaker, and a contract for the rolling stock systems and operations and maintenance, Speaker, valued at $9 billion. The member opposite wants to talk about a lack Thank you. of transparency, but we have publicly Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I would uh, tell the Premier and the Minister if she will respond to the second question I have here that you can't have financial disclosure in the dark. What we know, this is what we know. We know the southern portion of the Ontario line, as the government's currently proposed, is going to cost nearly a billion dollars per kilometer. Nearly a billion. But the Spadina subway extension that was completed in 2017 cost $384 million per kilometer. So what's happened? 
And we can't simply blame the pandemic, Speaker, because an April 2020 report reported that subway costs had doubled under this government. What I see, Speaker, sadly, at Metrolinx and Infrastructure Ontario are a lot of public-private partnership consultants, former staff members of this government, that seem to be enriching themselves at the expense of the Ontario public. So I ask the Premier, are you going to rein in these private consultants, these PT financiers, Order. and get our subway costs under control? Mr. Transportation. Look, Mr. Speaker, we've been clear. As soon as contracts are awarded, the values of those contracts are posted. They're publicly available for anyone, for taxpayers and global news to examine as they wish. What I know, Mr. Speaker, is that member opposite and that party of the party the leader of the, op the, uh, the opposition parties will do anything to make sure that we don't build transit in the greater Toronto area. Mr. Speaker, we put, that, we put out the largest transit expansion plan anywhere in North America, and that party voted against it. Mr. Speaker, we brought forward measures to accelerate the delivery of transit because we know we had to address the transit deficit that was left by the previous Liberal government who could not get transit in the City of Toronto built. We brought that forward, and what did they do, Mr. Speaker? They all voted against it. Mr. Speaker, Response? it's clear Order. that this is why they are in opposition, Mr. Speaker, because not only are they against transit, they're against building it faster. It's clear that they don't even know how to get it built. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. My riding of Carleton is home to a number of manufacturers that continue to make investments in cutting-edge technology to stay ahead of the global competition. Manufacturers like LTR Industries, which I visited with the minister, Fortran Steel, and Marathon Underground, which is Canada's leading specialty underground contractor located in the great community of Greeley. Mr. Speaker, these manufacturers are the lifeblood of not just communities in Carleton, but across the province. But these investments are both expensive and risky, and we know that business owners know that success is not always guaranteed. Through you, will the minister please explain how our government continues creating the conditions for manufacturing businesses in Carleton and across the province grow and succeed? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, it wasn't that long ago that companies were fleeing Ontario. 300,000 manufacturing jobs were lost, and our economic future was teetering. Thankfully, the government of Premier Ford was elected and declared Ontario open for business. Taxes were lowered, energy rates lowered, and the burden of red tape was reduced. This brought companies pouring back to Ontario. And now, with Budget 2023, there is even more great news for Ontario manufacturers. The Ontario Made Manufacturing Investment Tax Credit. If passed, it will provide companies with a 10 per cent tax credit, up to $2 million a year, on investments in buildings, equipment and machinery. Speaker, those companies will innovate, Response? become competitive and create even more great jobs for our families. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you, thank you to the Minister for his answer. The minister noted that the government's plan is working. Ontario has more jobs than ever, and the string of landmark investments is reverberating around the world. That's right. The world is taking notice. We cannot let this momentum slow down as investors look to safe and reliable jurisdictions like Ontario to set up shop and expand their businesses. Mr. Speaker, through you, will the minister elaborate on the plan to build Ontario's economy and how this is benefiting the province's manufacturers? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, Ontario is again known as the worldwide best place for manufacturers to invest, grow, and create jobs. By reducing the cost of doing business by $8 billion annually through lowering hydro costs, cutting taxes, and reducing red tape, we've seen businesses create 600 thousand new jobs since we were elected and with the new Ontario made manufacturing investment tax credit which will provide 780 million dollars in support over the next 3 years we know there will be more investment more innovation 
and more jobs. Speaker, thousands of manufacturing jobs have been reshored back to Ontario, and this additional tax credit Response. is the next big move in ensuring Ontario has everything a company needs to succeed. Thank you. Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. We have seen a scary trend in Hamilton of not-for-profit service providers closing their doors due to budget constraints. The Hamilton branch of the Elizabeth Fry Society is the latest organization to announce their closure. One volunteer said, quote, This is very distressing and sad news. The service provided by eFry are so amazing, and it is sad to think that all of these women who now have no support as they grow through court systems and try to get back on their feet. End quote. Quote, what's happening in Hamilton is clear. It's a clear example of the direct consequences of this budget, and it's obvious who is getting left behind. Can the Premier explain where are the supports in this budget for programs like Elizabeth Fry in Hamilton? The Solicitor General. Well, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. Let me be clear. There has been no changes to the funding for our community safety order programs. We continue to support women who are at risk of reoffending. The John Howard Society is delivering those services in Hamilton, Niagara, and the Brantford region. And our ministry continues to work closely with community service providers across the province in the delivery of community service support and programs. Mr. Speaker, I'll be clear again. We support the women who are at risk of offending, and this is a priority, and the services will be conducted out in this region by the John Howard Society. The, uh, supplementary, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. Things are bad in our jails and have gotten much worse at Vanier Centre for Women and Hamilton Wentworth Detention Centre. Because the Solicitor General is not honouring the original contracts with the Elizabeth Fry Society, it has had devastating consequences. Instead of having program support when dealing with sexual assault or human trafficking, women and gender diverse inmates are handed crossword puzzles to deal with their trauma because there's nothing else, not even pencil crayons anymore. Women used to have support while incarcerated that followed them into the community, and now they get a crossword. So my question is, will you negotiate a contract with Elizabeth Fry, and will you stop your ugly attack on women and recommit programs funding? I caution the member on her language. Solicitor General. Opposite, and I, I said it in my first reply. There's been no changes to the funding for our community safety order programs, but the Elizabeth Fry Society was not the successful applicant to deliver the community services there. It was the order. John Howard Society, order. and I want to say it again: we will continue to support Opposition women who are at risk of reoffending. Next question: the member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Solicitor General. The state of violence in our streets and communities is increasing daily. People are concerned, and with more and more stories of random attacks, they have good reason to be. The day-to-day -day lives of individuals and families are being impacted by criminal activity targeting them and their loved ones. Everyone in this legislature needs to take this matter seriously, and we need to work together to support those on the front lines who are responding to these violent attacks. It's wrong for the Leader of the Opposition to say that advocating for more frontline police officers is considered out of touch. Speaker, what is our government doing to support our frontline officers and people encountering these attacks? Good question. The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank our, our great member from Chatham, Kent Leamington, and for the great work he is doing in his community. Mr. Speaker, no words are adequate to console the family who recently lost their son Gabriel to senseless violence and we mourn his passing. And everyone in this House should agree that violence on transit or anywhere is unacceptable. The level of impunity is sickening. The behaviour lacks basic civility. And that's why, on this side of the House, we continue to support our men and women in uniform. And due to the work they do, and because of the work they do, they need our support and not contempt from their profession that we see from ranks in the opposition. All our provincial colleagues agree 
that the federal government must introduce bail reform now to reinstate law and order in this country. And we urge Minister Mendicino and Minister Lametti to do it now so we have safe communities, Thank you. which is our fundamental Thank right. you. Restart the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. As a former frontline uniformed police officer, I'm so proud of the accomplishments achieved by my fellow officers in the line of duty. Thank you. We put our lives on the line every day in service to our communities and to our province. Sadly, we've lost good women and men while responding to horrific incidents while serving to protect individuals and families. It's disheartening to hear members from the official opposition call for defunding and abolishing police services. In light of this growing concern about violence in our communities, we need to support the work undertaken by our officers and provide them with resources they need. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please re reiterate what his and our government's support to our dedicated Question. frontline police officers and the work they do? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again from the member uh, uh, from the member from the member from Chatham, Kent, Leamington. For this government, for this government, nothing is more important than our public safety, and we understand that our police services across our province are the front line that keep Ontario safe. And we're fed up with calls from the opposition that we should abolish and defund the police. This is not the policy of our government. And what we saw yesterday were more excuses from the opposition in their call to defund and abolish the police. On this side of the House, we have one message. We have the backs of everyone that keeps us safe today and every day. And Mr. Speaker, we will do everything we need to do to help keep Ontario safe. Next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. The government's so-called plan to address a doctor shortage is not working. My constituent, Sue Lee, has been on the wait list with Healthcare Connect for over a year to get a family doctor. Her son has a disability, and without completed forms from a doctor, they cannot access the disability tax credit program. The government has announced 8,000 new doctors. How many of these new doctors are operating in the London region? Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, since 2018, we've actually had 1,800 new physicians practicing in the province of Ontario. It's not enough, and we need to do more, and we are doing more. Of course, we are doing in the short term. We've already directed the College of Physicians and Surgeons to expedite, review, and ultimately approve and license internationally educated physicians who want to practice in the province of Ontario. Of course, with Bill 60, if the member opposite supports Bill 60, she will see that there is an as of right that allows physicians who are practicing in other parts of, of Canadian, in other Canadian jurisdictions, able to begin practicing in Ontario immediately while their uh, license is transferred to the CPSO. You know, we're doing so many things, and I'm, I'm very happy to share some of the longer term plans that we have in this Response. Supplementary question. Speaker, another constituent of mine has been on the waiting list for years on Health Connect. He recently suffered a cardiac episode. The hospital was able to prescribe medicine. He says he has, it, that has helped greatly, but without a family doctor, he could not get the renewal of this medicine. His mental and physical health have made it hard to maintain steady employment, and without a primary care provider, he feels that there is little hope for the future. Referring people to Health Care Connect is not a solution. Referring them to another long wait list is not a solution. When will this government take real action to ensure that there are effective, timely referrals to family doctors and not get put on the health care, I'm going to call it disconnect, Speaker. Minister of Health. 
Thank you, and I hope the member opposite is also highlighting some of the other pathways to, us, to assist her constituent, including community health centres that operate in 75 uh, locations across Ontario. But, you know, we've had the largest expansion of undergraduate and postgraduate education in over 10 years, and that is before we open two new medical facilities in Scarborough and in Brampton. We are absolutely seized with understanding and actioning what we see as we see an, an increased and aging population in the province of Ontario. You have a government that is making the plans and implementing the plans to expand all health care practitioners, not just physicians. We Thank are. you. The next question. Next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Ontario's clean electricity system is a major selling point when companies are looking to invest and grow their businesses. Thanks to the hard work and leadership of the Premier and many ministers in our government, Ontario is attracting tens of billions of dollars in new investments from companies like Volkswagen, Stellantis, Umacore, and others. Our government's commitment to the economy and the jobs needed for the future is grounded in the values of sustainability, responsibility, and cooperation. Under the previous Liberal government, reckless policies, excessive red tape, and mismanagement drove manufacturing jobs out of our province. I understand the Minister of Energy is developing more strategies to encourage jobs and growth in Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please describe what are the measures that will increase Ontario's competitive advantage? Minister of Energy. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member from Ontario's clean energy capital, the Durham region, for the question this morning. I was uh, pleased to join another member from that Durham caucus at Toronto Metropolitan University this morning to announce that Ontario is leveraging our world-class electricity grid by launching a voluntary clean energy credit registry. This registry is going to help boost competitiveness and attract jobs to Ontario, helping businesses meet their environmental and sustainability goals. And we know global businesses are looking to expand in jurisdictions like Ontario with clean and reliable electricity. Along with well-trained workforce, which we have, thanks to Toronto Metropolitan University, and competitive tax credits, which we have, thanks to the Minister of Finance, and an exemplary R&D ecosystem Spots. and clean energy in the province. The credit registry announced this morning is just one more reason for those big companies that the member mentioned to continue investing in Ontario. Great news. Great news. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for his answers. It is great news indeed that our government is taking action and utilizing Ontario's clean energy advantage to help us attract even more major investments. I am aware that competing jurisdictions in the United States, including New York and Texas, currently offer clean energy credits for sale. It is a positive step that our province has leveled the playing field and is demonstrating optimism about new opportunities for the future that will help build a strong Ontario. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please describe how clean energy credits will benefit Ontario's electricity grid, Ontario's economy, and Ontario's environment? Mr. Of energy. Matter of fact, I can. Thanks again uh, to the member. All types of businesses, including those in the automotive sector, are placing a greater emphasis on corporate environmental goals to use 100 per cent clean or renewable energy. Yeah, yeah. And this registry announced this morning means those businesses are going to have one more tool to meet those commitments and demonstrate that their electricity has been sourced from clean resources. And we had the folks from Bruce Power here earlier this morning as well. They've got a great medical license to open announcement that James Skoniak is making later today. As well, proceeds from this credit uh, registry, these sales are going to go into the newly established Future Clean Energy Electricity Fund, Mr. Speaker, wow. and that means we're going to be reinvesting that money in Ontario for new 
clean energy projects, Spons. Mr. Speaker, that are only going to make our grid greener, make our grid more reliable, and drive down electricity costs for the people of Ontario. Thank you. Next question, the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. In my riding of Thunder Bay Superior North, parents of children with autism face years of uncertainty because they can't access a diagnosis. Then they wait many more years because they can't access treatment dollars, and that's if they can find a service provider remotely close to where they live. With not even a mention of the word autism in the budget, Minister, what will your government do to make diagnostic and clinical services available to parents in northwestern Ontario now so that their children are not missing out on crucial early years of support? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thanks to my honourable colleague for the very important question. Mr. Speaker, um, what youth may be a percentage of our population but they're 100 per cent of our future, Mr. Speaker. And that's why when it comes to the program that the member is referring to, if you just go back to 2018 when we formed government, Mr. Speaker, out of the 31,500 children and youth that were registered, only 8,500 were actually receiving service. Fast forward to today, Mr. Speaker, not only have we doubled the funding of the Ontario Autism Program, Mr. Speaker, now 40,000 are now receiving funding. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the new programs that the families have access to have expanded set of core services that include applied behavioral analysis, speech language pathology, occupational therapy, and for the first Response. time, mental health services. Not just one service like they had, Mr. Speaker, but there's still more work to do. That's why the Premier entrusted me with this position, and I will do everything I can to make sure we. Thank you. I've heard from parents that the, that 40,000 number refers to one-off grants and really does not address the key problems that parents are facing. Mm -hmm. When providers are not available locally, therapy dollars go to travel, leaving less money for treatment. Yep. Adriana had to quit her job in Manitowoc and live with her son in Thunder Bay for months so that he could access essential therapy. Once completed and Adriana and her son moved back home, they had to travel back and forth four hours each way to continue receiving therapy in Thunder Bay. Will the government provide incentives to bring practitioners to our region and, whenever distance is a factor, provide travel grants so that all autistic children can access timely diagnoses and treatments? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Whether it's Jan or every single uh, member uh, that re that requires service, Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned yesterday, when you live in the best province in the greatest country in the world, it's the people that makes us so great, and that's why we can't leave anyone behind. That's exactly why we continuously looking at ways to make sure that we support every single person that needs it, especially, Mr. Speaker, including our most vulnerable, including those in need of support. Which is why I said I'm proud of the record of this government that doubled the funding of, of the Ontario Autism Program. It was, Mr. Speaker, to more than two-thirds of the youth and children that were waiting on the wait list had absolutely no chance at service. Now, Mr. Speaker, as I said, 8,500 before, now more than 40,000 40, are receiving support. And Mr. Speaker, once again, as I promised the member and every single family in this province, will continue continuously looking at ways to make sure that every children, every youth, every family is supported and we don't leave anyone behind. Next question. The member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Following the most difficult three years in recent memory, last Thursday's budget was an opportunity to address a wide range of issues that our students, teachers, and parents are facing, and they've been facing these issues for years. Instead, this government introduced a record 200, 200, 204 billion dollar budget, 0.7 billion dollar budget spending and somehow managed to come up well short when it comes 
to supporting our students. So now the FAO is predicting a $6 billion shortfall in education over the next few years. And with our schools facing a $16.8 billion repair backlog, education has been left out in the cold. Speaker, Ontario students are dealing with the negative impacts of a pandemic, made Question. worse by the underfunding and underspending. So why is this government shortchanging education again at a time when students' needs are at their all-time high? Order. Minister of Education to reply. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud to confirm that since the former Liberals were in power, our government has increased investment in public education by 27 per cent. A massive increase of investment. I mean, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite has systematically opposed every single increase of investment. They voted Consecutive order. consecutively to oppose order. an increase of staff by 7,000 education workers. They oppose the hiring of 800 more teachers. They oppose the hiring of 200 more principals. We just added $16 billion to renew and rebuild schools after they crumbled, after the cuts of the former Liberal government, the closure of 600 schools, which families today continue order. to get a price of. We have a plan focused Response. on getting kids back on track through modern schools, a modern curriculum, an increase of investment. You can count on our Premier to continue to deliver that for the kids of this province. Order. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Minister. You know, we're very grateful that the federal government provided supports to our schools during the pandemic, and we know that those supports are well needed. We still are facing the effects Order. of COVID-19 on young people. And we know the reports of students suffering from mental health and anxiety, and they require this support. So boards are now facing the the, the need to go back to pre-pandemic staffing levels at a time when the need is still there. Let's focus on our students with autism, students with exceptionalities, and students with special needs. We need to ensure that our school boards have enough resources so that these students that require additional supports have it when they need it. Mr. Speaker, we know that strengthening Question. Ontario's public education system is a key driver of success in Ontario, and it must be available to all students. Why is this government shortchanging school boards at a time when they need it now? Mr. Of education. Mr. Speaker, if only the member opposite brought the same energy when she was Minister of Education, opposed to her mayoralty campaign, maybe kids wouldn't be so behind in this province. But Mr. Speaker, we are committed to getting kids back on track. We just unveiled the budget, $2.3 billion increase overall, $1.3 billion in baseline funding increase to help the very children in Scarborough and in communities across this province. A plan to strengthen literacy, $25 million, the only jurisdiction to screen every child senior kindergarten to grade two in the nation doubling math coaches by an additional $30 million so we improve numeracy, numeracy skills, and in the Minister of Finance's budget, a specific increased commitment to strengthen financial literacy in the classroom. This is going to leave a legacy and help kids get back on track. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Across the province, and particularly my riding, Windsor to come see, it is evident that our government is working hard to build Ontario for the next generation. Many construction projects are underway across the region, both residentially and as business ventures. The pile driving we're hearing across the riding says it all. Local investments are driving a number of initiatives. With the investments made by our government for employers and for infrastructure projects, there's a lot of activity taking place that will help our neighbourhoods of Winter to come see succeed. However, in order to see these projects through to completion, we need to make sure that we have the people to do the work. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to attract more workers to the construction sector? Excellent. Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. And I want to thank the member uh, from Windsor to come see for being such a strong voice for the people of Windsor here at Queen's Park. Speaker, our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, has an ambitious plan to build the projects that families need, including in Windsor. Our construction workers are true heroes who are making our province stronger every day, and we need more of them. In the Windsor region alone, there are more than 11,000 jobs open at the end of 2022. 
That's why our government is rolling out new employment services to help more people find good jobs like those in construction, jobs with defined pensions and benefits where people can raise a family around. Speaker, we've also increased funding to our pre-apprenticeship programs to help interested job seekers try the construction trades and see which one is the best fit for them. We're doing so much more, Speaker, and I look forward to uh, the follow-up question. Thank you. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. And as you know, I love Windsor and Tecumseh. It is encouraging that under the leadership of the Premier and this Minister, our province has a robust plan to tackle the urgent shortage of workers in the construction trades. The communities of southwestern Ontario are counting on our government to implement measures that will increase the number of skilled trades and skilled trade workers so that important construction projects can get started and completed. Ontario needs workers, even more so, workers are needed now. We need to reverse long-held notions about the trades and the construction industry to encourage more people to pursue them as full-time careers. Speaker, can the minister please explain what investments our government is making to provide support for individuals who are looking for work in the construction industry? Minister of Labour. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can't think of a member from the Windsor region that has delivered so much for the city of Windsor in the history of this legislature, Mr. Speaker. We think of a brand new hospital that's going to be built, the Windsor Regional Hospital. Uh, we think of the brand new Stellantis plant that's being built in Windsor. So, congratulations to the member from Windsor Tecumseh uh, for his leadership. Yep. Speaker, we're making targeted investments in projects that are building a stronger Ontario for all of us. Over the past three years, we've invested more than $660 million in our skills development fund to get more people into the skilled trades. Through our pre apprenticeship program, we've invested $660,000 for Women's Enterprise Skills Training of Windsor to train women for well-paying and in-demand work in the electrical trades. Tuition is free, and the program uh, also includes paid placements, childcare, and transit passes. Speaker, these are life-changing opportunities to build uh, stronger families and stronger communities for all of us. The next question, the member for My question is for the Minister of Labour. Is reintroducing for the 16th time anti scab labor legislation. Anti scab labor legislation makes strikes and lockouts shorter and it protects vulnerable workers. The government keeps saying that they're working for workers. Well, they have a labor bill in front of this House right now. They can take real action to protect vulnerable workers, to protect workers' rights. Will the minister tell the hardworking workers in the gallery right now if he will bring anti-scab labour law to Ontario now? Mr. Labour. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm proud of uh, our government's work uh, under the leadership of Premier Ford to support workers in every community uh, across the province. That's why we've introduced uh, three pieces of legislation, uh, Working for Workers One, Working for Workers Two, and now we have a third piece of legislation uh, in front of us. But, Mr. Speaker, I have to ask the party opposite. I mean, when did you get lost? When did you Order. abandon workers uh, in this province? For example, Mr. Speaker, we hired more than 100 new health Order. and safety inspectors in the province. Do you know who said no? It was the NDP that voted to, strength, to Order. not strengthen health and safety. Uh, in this province, but Mr. Speaker, we'll continue opposition working every order. single day for all the workers in this province. A supplementary question, member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. The minister really did a good job of avoiding actually answering the question. Windsor Salt workers are here today, members of Unifor Locals 240 and 1959. They've been on strike for 40 days, fighting the outsourcing of their jobs by U.S.-based holding company Stone Canyon Industries. These workers and every other worker in Ontario deserve to have their rights and jobs protected. The Conservatives have had many opportunities in, since the legislation has been tabled 16 times to support anti-scab labour legislation, and they didn't. You can't honestly say you're working for workers and vote against anti-scab legislation, Speaker. It just doesn't jive. Speaker, Windsor Salt workers and workers across Ontario want to know. 
Will the Premier stand up for collective bargaining rights, stand up for workers, and finally pass anti scab legislation? No more rhetoric. Look right at those workers and tell them yes or no. Members, if you take your seats. Mr. Labour. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, uh, I can tell those workers at uh, uh, Windsor Salt. Uh, they are uh, true heroes in their communities. I know they're building a, a stronger Windsor for, uh, for the community there. But, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, I can tell you that our government has uh, sent a clear message uh, to Windsor Salt. We've been in uh, many discussions uh, with Unifor over the past uh, number of weeks. We want a deal at the table. Mr. Speaker, 98 uh, percent of all deals in the province of Ontario are done at the table. We want a good Order. deal, a fair deal for those Windsor Salt workers. And Mr. Speaker, uh, we know that they're at the table, and we want them to get a deal as quickly as possible. Next question, the member for Oakville, North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, and I would like to take the opportunity to congratulate the Minister on his new portfolio. <laughs> Children and youth in the child welfare system face barriers throughout their lives. We recognize that youth leaving foster care often struggle with educational achievement, unemployment, homelessness, early parenthood, and may get caught up in the criminal justice system. It is important that our government supports youth leaving care so they can have the same opportunities as their peers. The current system needs to change so that youth get the skills they need to build a brighter future for themselves. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to strengthen supports for young people transitioning out of the child welfare system? Good job. <laughs> minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the, uh, the wonderful and hardworking member from Oakville, North Burlington, for the great question and the great work that she does for her riding, Mr. Speaker. Our government's new youth leaving care policy and program, the Ready, Set, Go, is the most bold and innovative approach ever taken, Mr. Speaker, by any government to support youth leaving care. It is an evidence-informed investment in, in bright futures for youth. It, as, it, uh, as heard on Budget Day, Mr. Speaker, our government is investing $68 million with continuing funding. This investment, Mr. Speaker, will provide greater financial support so youth can find safe housing, a longer runway for youth until the age of 23, incentives for youth to participate in post-secondary with an additional bursary of $500 a month, and future economic stability through employment savings of up to 40 hours per week without clawbacks, Mr. Speaker. Now, many of these spots have traumatic personal histories and disrupted family lives, Mr. Speaker, and that's why they, sh they deserve a fair chance and adult, adult life, and we'll help them again. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It is encouraging that this government is addressing the needs of vulnerable youth through investments and a new framework. The Ready, Set, Go program is an important step forward and is another example of how government has taken action to ensure that youth have the opportunities to realize their full potential in life. However, it is a precarious time for young people when they transition from being a youth in care to becoming an independent adult. It is essential that young people have the right supports that will minimize risks and set them up for success in their careers and in life. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how the Ready, Set, Go program will support children and youth? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, every child in this province deserves a bright future. This includes kids in care, Mr. Speaker. Now, through the Ready, Set program, as early as age 13, we will prepare children by developing life skills, their unique cultures and identities, and relationships with peers and adults. By age 15, Mr. Speaker, youth will be offered a conferencing option, including a mediator if they choose to plan for their futures. By 18, social workers will be accountable for ensuring youth have the basics, like identification, banking needs, professional support, and co communications technology. For example, Speaker, age 18 to 23, youth will be supported with pathways to post-secondary training, trades, and employment. 
Now, to really ensure this program delivers on its promise to support these youth in building the lives they want and they deserve, Mr. Speaker, we are also measuring its impact through its implementation. You can only change what you can measure. And once again, Mr. Speaker, we will not let these youth go. Next question. A member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Toronto District School Board was forced to tap into their reserves during the pandemic. This was to fulfill actions identified by the province for the health and safety of school communities and the academic success of students. In a letter to the Minister last week, the Chair and Director of the TDSB wrote, and I quote, we have depleted any working reserves and used reserves put away for other purposes, end quote. The Financial Accountability Office reported that the Conservative government did not spend $432 million of allocated funding for education in this fiscal year. At the same time, the TDSB was being forced to tap into their reserves. Speaker, will the Premier repay the pandemic costs as requested by the TDSB? Mr. Education. Mr. Speaker, we will increase funding for school boards this coming school year by $1.3 billion as confirmed in the budget, an increase in our baseline funding this year as we have done every year. In TDSB, they have 16,000 fewer students enrolled in their schools. And even though, as you know, that funding for school boards is per pupil base. Even with fewer kids, their funding is still up compared to the Liberals by $38 million. Mr. Speaker, Order. there's a 5% increase in EAs. There's a 4% increase of custodians. In Toronto Catholic, they have 6% more education workers, 9% more custodians, 4% more principals and vice principals. This doesn't happen by chance. It happens because our government is investing in a responsible budget that lifts performance and reading, writing, and math gets back to the basics. And we're going to continue to make the case that children will be able to get back on track if they stay in school right to June without disruption. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The minister knows very well that as per the Education Act, the TDSB has to pass a balanced budget before June 30th. Boards are not allowed to run deficits. There is no more reserve funding. The minister is essentially forcing the TDSB to cut programs and lay off staff. We cannot afford to lose staff when violence in schools is up. We cannot afford to lose programs when student needs are high. Why is the government leaving our students and schools without the supports they need? Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, here in the legislature, we have New Democrats asking the government to renew a fund that they just oppose. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, that is there's inconsistency in the in the position of the NDP, where they voted systematically against the increases in staffing, against the increases in funding, and yet here they are today urging us to renew the very funds they have absolutely opposed each and every year. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to stand up for children, ensure they stay in school, ensure they have the resources and staffing in place. There's 7,000 more education workers, 800 more teachers, 200 principals. That happened because of, not in spite of, provincial investment, and that will continue under our Premier's leadership. Question, the member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mississauga is Ontario's third largest city, but over the last 10 years, the city has only built 2,100 new homes, far below what is needed. That is why it is concerning to see that the City of Mississauga rejected applications for two residential towers that would be built next to the Port Credit GO station and the Hazel McCallion LRT station under construction. Rather than working to get more homes built near transit, it appears that the City of Mississauga is opposing solutions that would make life easier and more affordable for individuals and families. It is absolutely critical that Mississauga builds more homes to support our, governed, our growing population, especially in the area where growth is needed. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking Question. to ensure more homes will be built closer to proximity to the transit network? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for uh, Mississauga Lakeshore for being such a such a champion for uh, housing in his riding. Our province is facing 
a historic housing supply crisis. We need more homes of all kinds, including homes for young Ontarians, newcomers, and seniors that are near transit. That's why last November I approved the new official plan for the region of Peel, which removes the discretion of lower tier municipalities to set maximum heights within major transit station areas. The intent of the plan is to ensure that transit supportive outcomes are achieved and that adequate housing supply is brought forward faster. The residents of the members' riding, uh, for, this will mean great things. It'll mean that if they work in Mississauga or in Toronto, that they have a fast, car-free commute, something that our government believes ought to be encouraged. Here, here, here. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the minister for that answer and for clarifying the lower tier municipalities can set maximum heights in major transit station areas. Several councillors have thanked me on this, recognizing, as the minister said, Ontario is facing a historic housing supply crisis. Under the leadership of our premier and this minister, bold and decisive actions are underway to build more housing, as it is clear that the status quo is not working. With the population of Peel region projected to grow by almost 2 million over the next three decades, forward-thinking approaches are necessary to build more housing. Mayor Crombie herself has spoken on this critical need for Mississauga to build up and increase density, especially near transit. Our government needs to act now to help incentivize more infield Question. development and coming up with solutions to address the serious issue. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government plans to increase housing opportunities in Ontario? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I can assure the member that my ministry is actively working with the region and the city to ensure that implementation of major transit station area policies conform with the Peel Region Official Plan. And Speaker, let me be clear. Provisions that would set maximum height limits in major transit station areas is contrary to the approved Peel Region Official Plan. We want to continue to, to put forward pro-housing policies that will help municipalities grow with a mix of ownership, with a mix of rental housing types, to meet the needs of all Ontarians, from single-family homes to townhomes and mid-rise apartments. We remain committed to working with all of our municipal partners and the federal government towards our common goal of building 1.5 million homes by 2031. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. There being